Hi, I'm Rachel Spears. I'm the Executive Director of Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta, here to talk to you today about three habits of highly effective board members. Uh, first, I want to tell you a little bit about Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta. Our mission is to provide free legal services to nonprofits. Uh, we match nonprofit organizations with volunteer attorneys from uh, corporations and law firms here in Atlanta that advise the nonprofits on their business law needs. Uh, in order to be eligible for our services, you have to be a 501c3 organization, established, already established as a 501c3. You have to be located in or serve the greater Atlanta area. And also, uh, you must serve low income or disadvantaged individuals in order to qualify. Finally, you must be unable to afford legal services. If you're interested in applying for our services, I encourage you to go to our website where you can find the request for legal assistance. Fill that out, it will start the screening process. Even if you don't apply for our services, I encourage you to check out our website. We have a ton of resources on there, legal alerts, recordings of past webcasts, and you can also sign up to get on our mailing list. You'll get an email every month with information about upcoming workshops and webcasts and also a legal alert for that month. So please check that out. A disclaimer before we start. This webcast is legal information. I'm unable to give legal advice, so I do encourage you to ask questions in the chat box, but please try to keep those questions general and not too specific so that I can um, provide information rather than advice. All right, let's get to the topic today. Um, first, I want to talk about why this topic. Uh, the way I came up with the idea for this webcast is based on conversations I've been having with nonprofit board members. These are board members of nonprofits that have failed. Unfortunately, over the past few years, we've seen several nonprofit organizations, nonprofits that have been well established and around for many years that have dissolved. And um, Many times this came as a surprise to the community, and it also finds out, turns out, came as a surprise to the board members of those nonprofits. So based on conversations with those board members, uh, I came up with several, several themes emerged from talking to them, and uh, I came up with these habits that nonprofit board members can adopt to hopefully avoid the same fate. But importantly, um, these habits are good uh, practices for all nonprofit board members to take on. Every nonprofit can benefit from board members who are engaged and involved. It will strengthen their nonprofit, which will help the community. I'm going to start off today with a hypothetical. It's important to know that this entire this hypothetical is entirely fictional. And the writing is really small. I apologize, so I'm going to read this out loud to you. Gail Dugater got a call at work from Ed Dixon, the executive director of We Help Indigent People, or WIP. It's really proud of that acronym. Gail has served on the board of WIP for four years, and she took the reins as board chair two months ago. Gail, Ed started, we have a situation. We are expecting a payment on a government grant any day now, but I'm concerned it won't come in time to make payroll on Friday. Can we ask the board for a loan to cover us until the grant payment comes in? Gail was shocked. What? How did this happen? Gail thought back to the last board meeting. Like every meeting, Ed in handed out a document which included WIP's financial information. Gail and the rest of the board looked it over while Ed talked about grants WIP was expecting. Gail did notice that revenue seemed to be down, but she chose her words carefully, asking Ed about any trends in the finances. Ed replied that there seemed to be a slowdown in payment under government grants, but he expected to be reimbursed in the next couple of months. The board then moved on to discuss an upcoming fundraiser. Following Ed's call about the loan, Gail suggested a meeting with Ed and the rest of the executive committee. At the meeting, Gail and the others asked to see the books and started to learn how dire the situation was. Ed revealed that he had been struggling to keep up with bills for months, thinking that those grant checks would come at any time. He even held off on paying payroll taxes for the last two payrolls so that he could cover the rent check. 
In reviewing the expenses, Gail and the board learned for the first time that Ed had recently paid a fundraising consultant $20,000 to help identify new sources of funding. Gail had a pit in her stomach. She had joined the WIP board because she believed in the mission and felt like she needed to get more involved in the community. She went to board meetings and WIP events, made an annual donation, and even encouraged her friends to donate to WIP. But now she asked herself, could I have done anything to, present this, to prevent this? Now this hypothetical may seem outrageous, and again, it is fictional, but it's based on situations I'm aware of. There are times when um, nonprofit board members seem to be completely unaware of what's really going, going on in the organization. So to start off the conversation today, I wanna set some background information on the legal duties of nonprofit board members. And we'll come back to the hypothetical. So in Georgia, there are three legal duties of nonprofit board members called fiduciary duties. Duty of obedience, duty of loyalty, and duty of care. I'm gonna briefly address each of these. The duty of obedience requires board members to follow the organization's governing documents. These are the articles of incorporation, the bylaws, usually the board has, adop has adopted policies as well. The board's responsible for making sure the organization follows those. Now, importantly, the board also has the option to revise those documents if they're not working. But once they're adopted, they do need to follow them. I find that a lot of nonprofit board members don't even have copies of these policies. So I think it's important that you make sure your board has copies of the governing documents and is familiar with them. Uh, the board is also responsible for carrying out the organization's mission and ensuring that the organization's resources are um, used for lawful purposes to promote that mission. So the board should always keep top of mind what the mission of the organization is and make sure the organization is um, using its resources, its time, its money in furtherance of that mission. Next, we have the duty of loyalty. This requires directors to give their undivided loyalty to the organization. So they need to put um, their interest in the organization above their own self-interest and the interest of their family members. So for example, if a board member is entering into a transaction with the organization, they probably need to stay out of that and follow the organization's conflict of interest policy because um, their self, own self-interest could come above that of the organization. We have, by the way, lots of resources on all these topics if you want to explore further, but that's the duty of loyalty. Finally, the duty of care. This is the one that's really important to our conversation today. This requires, legally is here, requires that a director act with a care that an ordinary prudent person in a like position would exercise under similar circumstances. So what do you expect board members to do? What do you think they need to be doing in order to do their job? Well, um, they need to be overseeing the organization. They need to be going to board members, reading documents, asking questions, um, overseeing the executive director. They need to be involved um, in fulfilling their duties. The role of the board um, is to determine the mission and purpose of the organization, as we mentioned earlier, also includes appointing, overseeing, and evaluating the executive director, overseeing the financial matters, um, protecting the assets of the organization, making sure they're not misused, and again, used to promote the mission. The board's responsible for ensuring the legal and uh, ethical integrity of the organization. There are lots of laws that apply to nonprofits and the board has a responsibility to make sure the organization is following those. Also, they have a responsibility to preserve the reputation of the organization. It's the board's responsibility to ensure that the organization has adequate financial resources to do its mission, to do its programs. And what comes from that is they need to fundraise for the organization um, and promote the organization in the community. Now, speaking as an executive director, I can tell you that board member, I do expect board members to donate to the organization. 
if they're going to be out there asking other people to give to the organization, I think they should sh show um, how they support the organization themselves personally with a donation. Um, but that is part of the broader responsibility to ensure that the organization has financial resources. The board's also involved in program in, the, in that they oversee them, they monitor programs, help strengthen them. They're not necessarily involved in the day-to-day -day activity of the programs. If the nonprofit has staff members, that should be their responsibility. Um, but there are small organizations that have working boards where board members are responsible for programs, but at some point usually grow to a point where they are not. So I want to return to our hypothetical, and this time I want you to read it to yourself and highlight areas where you think maybe things went wrong, and then we can talk about those. Um, and as part of this, um, I have a sound effect for you while you read it. Okay, so I can't ask you questions um, to see what you came up with. So what I'm gonna do is go over some of the issues that I spotted and I wrote it um, and give yourself a point for anyone you, oh, sorry about that guys. Um, give yourself a point for anyone that you come up with. So the first one I came up with is um, it seems to be like the board is not getting the financial information they need to fulfill their duties. Um, in order to fulfill the duty of care, they need to um, understand what's going on with the organization's finances and how the money is being used. doesn't seem like they're getting that. Also appears they didn't understand the financial information, maybe. Um, and part of the problem with that is it says the financial information was distributed at the meeting really hard for board members to um, take in the information, to digest it, to identify questions they have if they're just getting it at the board meeting. Especially when, while they're looking it over, Ed is talking about grants. Really hard to focus in that situation. We don't know what material, financial information, he handed out, but it appears that the board had no idea of the financial situation that this organization was in. Was in. So probably was not adequate information for them to know what was going on. Also, you need to make sure the board understands the financial information. If you as a board member are on a board and you're given um, financial statements and you don't know how to analyze them, you need to get help. And it might be good for your board to have a board training on understanding financial statements, get some resources. Maybe the treasurer can help educate the rest of the board about this, but that's really important that your board understand what they're getting. I also um, noticed in the hypothetical, um, it says that Gail chose her words carefully when she asked a very general question about the finances. Um, this is something that came up in my conversations with board members. There was a hesitation to be the bad guy, to ask questions when they had a feeling that something might be wrong. They didn't want um, to do that in front of the rest of the board members. That's a real problem. Board members need to speak up in this situation, ask questions, make sure they get the information they need so they can fulfill their duties. Um, you can also follow up afterwards. It doesn't, if you feel like you're making a big stink at the board meeting, you can follow up afterwards with the executive director, but make sure you get that information that you need. Um, there's also obviously in this hypothetical a delay by the executive director in notifying the board about what's really going on with the organization. I have seen this with nonprofits where the staff is keeping it from the board how bad the situation is. They think they can fix it. Um, in some cases, the staff is acting improperly, but in a lot of cases, they just don't want the board to know, and that's the wrong way to handle these situations. The board needs to know what's going on so that they can try to resolve the issues. 
I have to point out this failure to pay payroll taxes is a really big deal. Um, and I have seen this happen where um, nonprofit staff in an effort to just keep up with um, bills they have to pay uh, did not turn over the payroll taxes to the IRS. This is probably the worst thing you can do because the IRS will come after the organization. They also have the ability to potentially come after individual board members. Um, yes, board members can be personally liable for unpaid payroll taxes. So your board members have a um, real interest in making sure those payroll taxes get paid. And again, the board needs to know if the organization is in a situation where they are having to choose which invoices to pay so that they can help decide how that money gets spent. Um, in this hypothetical, Ed paid a fundraising consultant $20,000. Um, and the board was unaware of that. That's a real problem that the um, executive director made a large payment without budget, without board approval. Uh, I'm assuming that was not in the budget, so any large expenditure like that should be okayed by the board. Um, I've seen this happen where a staff person thinks, oh, if we can just get a grant or something, this all will resolve itself, so I'm going to spend this money kind of as an investment without getting input from the board. That's a big problem. Um, and then we've got some limited engagement potentially of board members. Gail went to meetings and events and felt like she was really involved. But maybe maybe um, their board needed to step up their involvement in the organization to know more about what's going on. And finally, uh, there's a thing in here where Ed is asking the board for a loan. Just wanted to highlight that as a potential conflict of interest. We have had situations where board members have made loans to the organization, um, but be careful because it potentially could pre prevent, present a problem where the board member's interest in getting repaid by the organization may come in conflict with their loyalty to the organization. So you'll need to follow your conflict of interest policy and get help with that. So now that we have identified some issues, um, again, kind of in speaking to these board members, I asked them, what lessons did you learn from your experience um, serving on the board of these failed nonprofits that you'd like to pass along so that others um, don't face the same fate? But these are habits that every board member should adopt. Every organization will be strengthened. Um, if your board members are staying engaged, if they trust but verify, and if they ensure checks and balances. So my first habit, stay engaged. Um, going back to those duties of care, make sure you are doing those things and taking your duties seriously. First, attend meetings. People are very busy. It's hard to find a date that works for everybody. But as a board member, you need to do everything you can to get to those meetings. Um, I talked to a board member who said to me, if, you know, sometimes people have to join by phone and you may allow that of your board, but as board members, you need to ensure that that's the exception. Um, this board member I spoke to said that if she has to attend by phone, she makes sure that the next board meeting she shows up in person. But she says you miss cues when you are on the phone, you know, raised eyebrows by other board members. You may miss some things. Um, if you're not there in person. Also, you might be checking emails. I mean, be honest with yourself. You might be doing things and not entirely focused. So really important to attend meetings and attend them in person, if at all possible. Uh, board members should review materials in advance of the meeting. That means the executive director needs to get those materials out. I try to get them out a week in advance, and my board has a chance to review them. Um, and the board should not show up at the board meeting and start reading them. They should have read those in advance. Um, read the minutes so that when you get to the board meeting, you are ready. Um, and you may even be able to ask some of those questions in advance of the meeting and save some time at the meeting. Um, outside of board meetings, um, because board members should not just see their responsibilities as limited to those few hours, once maybe a quarter that you're at a board meeting, you need to attend the organization's events if possible um, and volunteer if there's a role for you to play. 
um, the more you can be involved in the organization, the more likely you're to know what's really going on. Uh, with staff, I think it's a good idea for at those events board members to interact with staff. Um, I'm not saying staff should abuse that and go to the board with complaints, but it's good for board to know staff. I think they'll hear more things and just be more aware. Um, finally, uh, what I would say about the best board member is the, is the board member that keeps the organization top of mind. You want board members that, even if they're not at a meeting at your event, they're thinking about your organization. If they're meeting somebody that might be able to help your organization, if they read the paper and learn about a program that you know might be able to partner with your organization, that's the kind of board member you want. Um, someone who's passionate about the mission and always thinking of ways um, to build up the organization. Um, for board members, make sure you join the board for the right reasons. It takes a lot of work to be on a board um, and to stay engaged. And I think if you are passionate about the mission, um, really believe in the work of the organization, you are more likely to do that. So don't join a board to check the box or because a friend asked you to. Um, really know what you were getting into before you commit. I have a question about staying engaged. Mm -hmm. um, is it okay for a board member to use email as a way to get further clarification or questions answered if they don't want to kind of bring it up at a board meeting? Um, yeah, I think that's fine. Um, if you are hesitant, again, if you kind of ask your question and it doesn't get answered and you don't want to cause a big stink, I think it's totally okay to follow up and you can do that by email. Um, if you're getting the information you need, at some point you may need to pick up the phone as well. Okay, my second good habit, trust but verify. So as a quick aside, I thought President Reagan came up with this in the Cold War, but turns out it's an old Russian proverb but verify. I learned that from Chernobyl, a documentary. Um, it's a great um, thing for board members to think about, and this came up in my conversations with board members. Um, have faith in your executive director, but make sure you're getting some backup documentation um, on things. You don't have to double check everything, but it's a good idea to have somebody um, checking on the information. So all of your information is not coming from one person. Um, so specifically, financial statements. Make sure you are getting the financial statements you need, like we talked about earlier. Make sure you understand them. Um, and speak up if you feel like you need training or would like them presented in a different way. Um, my board asked um, for some charts that I was able to produce in QuickBooks. It's just a different way of seeing the information that was easier for them. As far as what those financials look like, um, you can do it different ways, but generally you're gonna see some sort of balance sheet, statement of financial position, and a cash flow statement. Those are all reports that I can produce in QuickBooks. I think they call them something a little bit different. Um, but those are things I share at every board meeting. I also share a document which shows our budget versus actuals for the year, which is really helpful to the board. And the statement of financial position or statement of activity, which shows our expenses um, and revenue for the year, I can also produce that in a way that compares it to the prior year. And that's something the board likes to see because it highlights things that are kind of out of whack. Um, so these are things the board has told me they need in order to be able to spot potential issues. I'm happy to provide that to them. So um, nonprofit executive directors and board members should to talk to each other about how to make sure they're getting the information they need. Uh, it's enough for, I think, for the board as a whole to review these doc reports produced, but someone on the board should be looking at the backing information. So our treasurer gets credit card statements and bank statements and copies of all the monthly reconciliations. So it's really important that somebody is looking at at the materials to back up the reports you're getting. Um, in addition to financials, the board should be responsible for reviewing reports about the programs of the organization. Again, y'all should talk to each other about what does the board need in order to make sure they're doing their job to oversee programs and making sure they're effective. And then have the staff get that to the board um, for each meeting. 
Again, this is assuming there is a staff. So if there's no staff, the board um, may be more involved in, in that. Um, next, review insurance policies and important contracts. I think this is something the board maybe has more of a hands-on approach, but I specifically had um, a nonprofit where turns out the staff had let the DNO insurance lapse and the board did not know that. And um, it presented a real problem for the board. So you may want to ask to actually see those policies. We'll talk about a little bit later, but you may want to have an annual check-in with the insurance broker. That's a real worst case scenario, but if you have any concerns at all, um, you know, by asking to see that, if that's something you really care about, don't be shy about asking to get a copy of it. Uh, we talked about this a little bit in the hypothetical, but it's really important that board members ask questions. And if they're not satisfied with the answer that they investigate until they get the information they need. Um, you know, board members, you can't hesitate to speak up and be seen as the bad guy, but we've talked about ways maybe you can follow up later. Um, and do things just to make sure you get the information you need. Uh, really important that you don't ignore problems, but you address them. And finally, I heard multiple times from board members of these failed nonprofits, they wish they had listened to their gut. There was something telling them that something wasn't right and they didn't follow up on it. So follow up. Uh, talked about this a little bit, but it's good for the board to have communication with um, someone other than just the CEO or executive director. Um, also, the board should feel free to seek advice in order for them to do their job. Maybe they need to consult with an accountant or lawyer. That's perfectly fine for the board to do that. I encourage you to do that. And it's a good idea to check in with these advisors annually. So maybe that the accountant works mainly with um, the staff of the organization, but it's good for the board to have an annual check-in with the accountant. They may learn something they didn't know about. Um, that's, um, I had a nonprofit where if only they had had a conversation with, they had an outside bookkeeper. And once they realized that things were not going well at the nonprofit, they learned a lot from that outside bookkeeper. Um, or the insurance agent. Just a good idea to check in with these folks, have the board check in with these folks on an annual basis and you may learn things, um, information that the board has not been getting. Okay, my third habit, ensure checks and balances. So some of the nonprofits that I've seen shut down unexpectedly did so um, or face real problems that maybe they recovered from, but it was a result of embezzlement or theft by an employee. So I want to speak a little bit to that. It's really important that every organization put in internal controls when it comes to the finances of the organization. So the way money is handled, you need to make sure that those duties are divided up amongst multiple people. Don't have one person um, handling the money because things could really go wrong. And um, not just that somebody might steal from the organization, but they might make mistakes and there's nobody else to catch those mistakes. Um, so even for a small organization, find ways to divide those duties. If you have a volunteer board treasurer, maybe have the bank statements go to them. Maybe have um, someone else uh, write the check request and then another person sign the checks. How can you, divide up the duties so that it's not one person. Uh, other areas where problems can come up are with cash. Any, if your organization, for whatever reason, has to have cash around, be really careful. Make sure you have um, mechanisms in place to try to keep track of that cash and not have it go missing. Same with inventory. If you have a large inventory, maybe laptops or something like that, Make sure you have a good system for keeping track of those. Um, make sure um, more than one person is involved in the payroll, so there can't be any problems with that. And um, finally, invoices. That's where you see a lot of embezzlement is people messing with invoices. So if you have 
a treasurer or somebody who's also reviewing these, it's more likely to get caught. Um, the board should also review and approve budgets, as we mentioned in the hypothetical. And um, if there's anything, out, a large expenditure outside of the budget, they need to be involved and decide whether or not to approve it. Okay. Um, last slide about ensuring checks and balances. Make sure you have um, good bookkeeping and auditing. That means make sure the bank accounts are reconciled monthly. And again, those are sent to the treasurer for review. Um, not every organization has to have an audit. It depends on the size of your organization and it could also depend on whether you get things like government grants. But um, for those organizations that do get audited financial statements every year, don't count on that audit to catch everything. I have a client that had an employee stealing for them, from them for years and they were shocked because they got an audit done every year and the audit didn't catch it. So I just tell you that so you don't expect, oh, we're fine, I don't have to do anything because we get an audit. The board still has a role in monitoring the financials of the organization. Um, it's also the responsibility of the board to look at the long-term financial planning of the organization, make sure there are sufficient reserves for the organization. Um, also, in terms of the board's responsibility for legal and ethical compliance, uh, the board should make sure that the nonprofit is getting all their paperwork in, particularly the paperwork to the IRS, the 990, annual 990. Uh, we have had multiple clients lose their tax exempt status because they failed to get their 990 in. Um, so the board has a role in making sure that's reviewed. And actually, if you look at the form 990, one of the questions says, has the board reviewed this document before it was submitted. Have the board, send it to the board, give them time to review it before you send it to the IRS, but meet that deadline. Um, finally, uh, be a check on unbridled optimism. I find that nonprofit people are beautifully optimistic and that's one of the reasons they are in their role because they are optimist, um, but being an optimist can be a problem if you expect every government grant to come in on time, if you expect to receive every grant you apply for, if you expect things to always go well, you may not be prepared when things go, start to go wrong. So this is something I heard from board members. It's really important that they have the information they need, that they ask questions to kind of act as a check on that and ask um, the nonprofit staff, what is plan B? Let's say if we don't get this grant, or what is the likelihood um, that this funding will come in? It's really important for the board to play that role. So um, just to wrap up, our three habits of highly effective board members, stay engaged, trust but verify, and ensure checks and balances. Um, your organization will benefit if you um, have a board that's adopting these practices. And for those executive directors watching today, I encourage you to share this with your board um, to get them understanding their responsibilities as well. Any questions? Um, you recommend an annual check with insurance brokers or auditors. Should they be invited to a board meeting or how, how would you recommend that check? So with the insurance broker, I think it would be unusual for them to come to a board meeting. Um, but I think, you know, the board chair or somebody on the board check in with a board member. Just, you know, I think that can be really informal. With the auditor, sometimes the auditor does come to a board meeting or meet with if you have a finance committee. Um, you can do that different ways. That's usually a little bit more formal. The auditor might want to ask the board questions as part of their audit. Um, so that is something you can talk to the auditor about. Um, and that's all the questions we have. All right, thank you very much for your time today.